I sound fine, by the way. Right yeah, now. yeah. No, it's perfectly fine. I hope the live stream is also gonna work. If not, I will just tell them, go to our live stream. <laughs> <laughs> To here with me today because in January oh, hold on. restart oh restart the intro <laughs> it took longer than I thought do you usually a live stream or do you mostly do edited videos I started I think two months ago or something like that with streaming the stuff that I'm doing I'm also new into the, this field and I didn't even expect like this is also what I wanted to say in the introduction someone like you that did so much stuff to talk to me and I'm just literally a baby in this field it's okay I don't I don't have a very high bar at all I don't have to like <laughs> talk to only famous people or whatever <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I just like, I enjoy streaming and talking about random stuff, so I don't know. And I'm, I mean, I think your perspective is valuable as well. Um, Thank you. Just hearing someone who's new and like, what, what are the things you like with the games mm -hmm. industry? Um, and so forth. So I think that's it's yeah. a valuable perspective, definitely. Uh, Thank you. Hello, friend. Hello, you guys. It's truly an honor to have you here with me today. Because in January, when I started to become passionate about this field and I discovered your channel, I didn't even think that we would ever have the chance to talk. But here we are. So today, we will discuss about your incredible work in game dev and your educational content on YouTube. You're well known for your detailed and engaging tutorials that make graphics and math more accessible to everyone which I think is very, very cool and useful, especially for babies like me in this field. Uh, you are also the creator of Shader Forge. You founded a company and many other brilliant stuff that I really admire and respect. But before we dive into the questions, would you like to tell us a bit about how you got started in this field and what inspired you to become a game developer and content creator? Oh boy, that's a very <laughs> broad <laughs> question. Um, so why did I start making games? Um, I think it was... I guess like most people, you kind of grow grow up playing games and seeing games. Like, I guess for me it was like the early PlayStation One games. I played a lot with my sister and my father, um, and it was just an interest growing up. And then, you know, as you get older, you kind of realize that like, oh, it's actually like people that make these things. And then you start learning about that. And then, eventually, I kind of realized that this is really really fun. Like it's, yeah, it's just incredibly enjoyable to just work on all of this stuff as soon as I got into like what it means to make you know I started out doing level design and then level art uh, 3d modeling and then eventually coding as well and once I got into all of those things it was just I don't know it's just super cool that video games were kind of like the you kind of take every single art form and shove it into a single thing and then there's just this entire landscape of possibilities and things you can do uh, within that space, which I thought was super cool. Um, so I think that was that was one of the things that were, that was interesting to me uh, and what got me hooked because it was also very fun to work with that. That's nice. In an interview, you mentioned making the transition from Unreal Engine to Unity. Can you share what motivated the switch and how it impacted your development process? Yeah, at the time, what was I doing? I, th I think I think that I was at, I was at Future Games, which is a uh, game dev school in Stockholm. Um, and they went through a bunch of different engines like the the first you know when i was studying we had three game projects our first game project out of the three uh we we made a board game so i guess we didn't use any engine it was just kind of like all right we're gonna do some pure game design without any technology and just figure out um you know game design is something you can do without technology right um and then we went from there to uh, Unreal. So Unreal was the the first engine uh, we used there. Uh, and before then, I'd only ever used um, Game Maker. Uh, I think I tried RPG Maker, but I was just using Game Maker to make like simple like 2D tile based um, pixely games. Um, and then, uh, but yeah, so, so it was mostly just like, you know, our school was like, all right, we're gonna switch from Unreal to Unity now after, you know, our Unreal project. And yeah, and, and that was, that was, it wasn't like any informed switch it was just because that's what we were learning next um but then i think what got me hooked with unity is that uh this was like i don't know when was it like 10 years ago 12 years ago how old am i oh my god uh i think so so at that time the unreal engine um was not as established as its own engine at that time um it was called udk and UDK was basically Unreal Engine 3, but slightly easier to use for something that's not an Unreal Engine game, or an Unreal game, rather. Um, so, so at the time, it was kind of like, 
when you started a project in UDK, you would like spawn with a character from Unreal Tournament with a first person control and audio and models and like the, all of that was there immediately and you held a gun. Um, and so that was got, like, okay, so if I want to make something in Unreal, I'm starting out with a like first person shooter and then I have to like work my way backwards if I want to make something else. Uh, and it was just kind of a mess. Uh, it seemed really difficult to get any kind of like um, your own functionality in, except for the like level scripting stuff they had of like, it was called Kismet back then. Um, it was just kind of clunky. Uh, and then when we switched to Unity, uh, it was like, you know, when you start a new scene in Unity, you just have an empty scene and a camera and it's just have at it, do whatever you want, basically. And so that kind of blank slate was really appealing to me because I, um, I wasn't too into making first-person shooters and I wanted to make other things and that was just hard in UDK. So in Unity, that was just much easier. Um, and then also the um, Unity was just a lot more lightweight uh, as well. So it was just easier to jump into and do stuff. Nice. Okay, interesting. And now speaking of Unity and going into Shader Forge, how did the idea for it came about? For Shaderboard, I yeah. just missed the material editor in uh, Unreal. It, it's not really much deeper than that. It's just like <laughs> Unreal had a material editor. I loved making materials in Unreal and um, Unity didn't really have that at the time. There was a plugin called like Strumpy Shader Editor, uh, which was not very visual. It was just kind of like nodes without any like visual previews. Um, and I don't know, it was not very good. Um, so, so I was kind of like forced to learn how to code shaders at that time uh, in order to do that in Unity. Um, so like I mentioned, I've been doing a lot of environment art in Unreal. Um, so just using the material editor was something I loved doing. Um, but then coming to Unity, I had to learn how to do it by hand. In other words, like code shaders instead of like connecting nodes. And um, once I learned how to code shaders, I realized that even though I had learned how to do it with code, uh, I was just like, well, this feels kind of stupid. Like, I'm I'm making an incredibly visual thing, but I'm doing it with code. And so I can't really see every step along the way. Um, and so, so I just missed that a lot from the Unreal Engine. And so, so I was just like, okay, can I can I make my own tool like that in Unity? And so started looking into, you know, the... Um, um, looking into like editor scripting in Unity. Um, so I was kind of like learning shader coding and editor scripting at the same time, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, it was kind of a, it was a little bit of a bit of a mess. Uh, I'm not particularly proud of the code base of Shaderforge, uh, but I guess that's always the case with like older projects. Um, but yeah, I just missed it from Unreal. Um, and. And, you know, once I reached a point where like, okay, now it's useful to a point where I'm using it a lot, then obviously then you can kind of see like, okay, this is something that's useful for other people as well. Uh, Unity had their own asset store and I was like, all right, I might as well just try releasing it on the asset store and see how it goes. Um, and it went really well, like surprisingly well. Uh, that basically funded the studio that I started afterwards, uh, which was oh. great. Yeah, that's very, very nice to hear. One curiosity that I have is now, let's talk about your early experiences. Could you share how you got into programming and if anyone or anything inspired you? Because I'm also very, very new, as I've told you. I my, Like my background is of literature, psychology, philosophy, stuff like that. I literally learned how to program exactly one year ago. So mm -hmm. tell me about your experience. So most of my learning experience is generally just I am super interested in something. I get really, really attached to something and I really want to create something. Uh, and then if I have to learn something in order to create the thing that I want to create, uh, let's say that that's programming, then I'm going to have like near infinite energy to learn that thing in order to like create the thing that I wanted to create. Um, so like, I almost never set out to be like, you know, oh, today I'm going to learn how to code in JavaScript or today I'm going to learn how to like yada yada. Like it's always like I have a goal in mind first and then the stuff I need along the way is secondary. Yeah. So programming was another one of those things where, you know, when I started using Unity, like 
if I wanted to have my own functionality in the game where I wanted my own behavior and my own types of movement and controls, all of that requires programming. And so, um, yeah, it was just like kind of a natural next step in order to make my own like games. So, um, yeah, it was not like a super um, conscious effort to learn specifically in that sense. Um, but yeah, I just, everything I do is like very much fueled by like motivation. Um, I'm, I'm one of those like lucky people who have a very like high baseline motivation to do stuff. Um, and so, yeah, I, I don't really have any like advice if people are like, oh, how do I learn this the most efficient way? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm just excited about it. And then I spend a lot of time doing it. I empathize with this. Sometimes when I hit the pillow, all the ideas came in and I'm like, I can't sleep tonight anymore. I have to do this thing instead. So yeah, I know how this is like, but um, your passion is the way you're living right now. I mean, making a living out of your passion, I think is the key in life. So all the respect for this as well. Yeah. It is a little bit scary in some sense though, because it, it has a lot of drawbacks that I think a lot of people are not aware of. Um, there's like, it's, it's very much possible to get into um, a state where like if you're if you're doing your dream job and you're one person doing the thing that you love doing, um, the flip side of that is that you are entirely responsible to make sure that you stay alive financially. Um, and that like if you are 100% safe and you have something in the background that just like generates money or whatever, then maybe that that's not a huge problem. But generally, you have to you have to actually make sure that you keep making money um, and the scary part with that is that it's very easy to kind of get stuck feeling like you um, you have to do the things that make money rather than the things that you like doing. Um, and it's really easy to get blinded to that and lose sight of what you actually enjoyed to begin with and like what decisions you're making because you're stressed about money and what decisions you're making because you're you just want to do something fun. Um, so the lines between like work and hobby become incredibly blurred. And um, something that happened to me was that I got burnt out and getting burnt out when you're doing your dream job is a really weird situation to be in. Um, so, so I would just like caution people that it's not as as like rosy as people make it out to be to like do your dream job. Um, obviously, if you are 100 percent financially safe, then it's great. Uh, but if you're not, then there's a lot of pressure on you and you have a single point of failure. Like if you're sick for a month, like your business stops for a month, like nothing happens for a month. Um, and so, so that stuff can be kind of scary. I'm also thinking about this because uh, next year, my latest year of university, I have to choose an internship. And when I first started this university, I was very into UX design. And right now I got very, very passionate about game development in general. I don't know exactly which area or which like level designer I, I don't know yet but the thing is i'm still thinking if i should switch completely to game dev or still go into ux so yeah um well i mean there's ux within game dev mm -hmm. so that's true I, I guess it depends on like how much you want to specialize i i don't know what the market looks like i am a i'm horrible at like anything business related um but but yeah there's definitely ux within game dev especially at larger companies because then you know if you have a team of like more than 100 people there's going to be people dedicated to doing ux specifically um so, so if you're like really passionate about like a niche uh, area within game dev, uh, larger studios have a ton of roles like that. Um, but if you're in a smaller studio, then generally you're gonna have to have a broader skill set than that. So, so like if you like doing a UX, uh, you might also be doing the implementation of the UI and like uh, everything related to that, right? Uh, rather than just the the UX and the design part itself, then I would say that you're like super early in terms of figuring out what you enjoy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think at this point, I'm just giving advice because that's what I did. But thank you. Like I think at this point, what you what you should do is explore everything within game development because there is so much to it. Like there are so many different things you can you can like dive into, enjoy, and do, and like all of that stuff. And so. Uh, I would take a very like exploratory approach, um, find the things you love doing within games. And if it turns out to be only UX, or if it turns out to be like only systems programming, or if it turns out to be like doing 2D art or 3D modeling, like there's so much there. And 
uh, exploring, I think would be the priority. Uh, if you want to like, if you want to have some certainty about like what you want to do next. Um, I guess that depends on time pressure and whatnot, but yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. This is also why I opened up the YouTube channel. I was like, I want to meet people in this field and I want to exchange thoughts and stuff like that. So thank you very much for being here as well. Okay, I'm going to pick up the rest. Sure. Thor, Thor does this every now and then. He He's an old man and he runs around and yells. It sounds very concerning, but we have been to the vet multiple times and they have no idea why. He just runs around and screams for like Whoa. one hour a day or so. So you've worked on various projects throughout your career. What are your favorite ones and why do they hold a special place for you? Uh, why have I not thought about this before? It's hard to, to like pick any specific one. Depending on how long you work on them, there is a... Um, like you kind of enjoy them to different amounts. I think anytime you're excited about something and you start out working on a project, that's the best like part. Like the first, I don't know, first half year of any project and, and even just the first like few months of a project, um, it's like so enjoyable. Um, but once you get to a stage of like, you know, you've been working on something for two years and now you need to ship it. And now you have like so many things you need to fix and like bugs that you have to work out. And like, you've done all the fun stuff. Now there's only the like chores left in the project. Uh, I think it's very easy to kind of like not enjoy working on it for the last bit. Uh, and it was definitely like that for uh, like budget cuts, the VR game we worked on um, where like, you know, we started out, um, you know, we, we were at GDC, we were two people at our company um, and so we started out at, at GDC and we met with Valve and we like randomly asked them at a party like, hey, can could you get us a dev kit for the Vive? It was like before the Vive was released and, and they were just like super chill. They were just like, sure, we can get you a dev kit. Why not? Um, and then that kind of like kickstarted the whole like arc at Nicorp where we started experimenting with the Vive. Um, and that was the first time I had experimented with VR and that was super fun. I like those early days of VR where, you know, it was it was just game developers who were really enthusiastic about an entirely new design space. Like, how do you do games in VR? It's such a different medium. Um, and like learning about that and exploring that like mechanically uh, was super fun and and challenging as heck because um, I'm not, have you worked in VR before? No, not yet. Okay, so so one of the biggest issues with VR is that you can't move the camera in the game, um, which puts a lot of restrictions on what types of games you can make, right? Um, you can teleport the camera if you want to, that's fine, but you can't have the camera smoothly accelerate anywhere at any moment. Um, or if you do, then whoever's playing your game is going to get sick. Um, or, well, some people don't, but most people get sick. Um, they get motion sickness very quickly. Um, and, and so, so if you're thinking about like, okay, so how do we design a first person game in VR? Then, okay, so just movement is immediately just off the table. We can't use like, like a joystick to move your character because then we need to move the camera in universe, right? And then you're going to get motion sick and then, okay, so how do we work around that? then, okay, then maybe I guess we can just teleport because teleportation is not, but doesn't involve any like acceleration, which is the thing that makes you motion sick. Um, and so that works, that's fine. Um, and, and yeah, so there's just a ton of challenges there. Um, but the thing that is like, one of the coolest things in VR, especially the, the type of VR that we made where it's designed for you to stand in the center of a room and you're literally like crouching and like throwing things with your arms and you're like, yeah, you're like moving your entire body. You're not just sitting in front of a computer. Um, and it was the first time, like when we play tested the early versions of budget cuts, it was, it was so cool to see how like immersed people got into the game. Um, like we had one part of the game where uh, you were like crawling in this like ceiling space and in order to get up there you have to crouch uh, because it's low right um so you teleport up into the ceiling space and every player that play tested they like physically have to crouch like there's no crouch button right um and then we had a 
um, we had a hole in the floor, like just a ceiling tile that was removed. So when you're like like walking around up in the ceiling space, there's a hole in the floor. Um, and I swear to God, nine out of ten playtesters try to look down the hole in the floor. So they hit the headset in like on the physical real world floor, trying to look down the hole in the ground. Uh, and it's like, I've never seen that kind of immersion where they're so immersed that they forget that there's a literal floor under them, right? Um, and and like just as as a like as a game designer, like having your player be that into the world you're creating is amazing. Like that that is so rare to get people that invested, right? Yes. Uh, that was super cool. Um, and and just everything that was, you know, we we never had people so excited and like. I don't know, it, like quite often when you show your game to someone, they're like, oh, seems cool. Not really my type of thing, but it's all right, I guess. Like that's a very common response. Um, but then with this game, it was like, holy shit, this was a whole other experience. And yeah, I don't know, it was just super cool. Obviously, a lot of that is thanks to VR and not specifically thanks to our game. But yeah, so my point was, sorry, I went a long it's time to do a budget cuts. My point was that the beginning of budget cuts when we worked on that game uh, was super fun it was experimental and it was a lot of like talking between developers and it was like creative and interesting uh but then we needed to ship a game that was supposed to make money and then you know you kind of get into this thing where like okay we've done all of the all of the experimentation we found the things that work and now we need to create hours of content for you to play um and i noticed that there were a lot of issues with the way that we created uh, level design and, and whatnot in that game that made me just less interested in doing that. Uh, and so there was just a lot of less interesting work ahead. But like the, the end of development of budget cuts was like, a, it was just dreadful. <laughs> Like, I I guess it's very common that whoever's in production of a game, like, once you release the game, you kind of hate the game. <laughs> but, but like, in the beginning, you're always, like, super excited about it. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure which project I would say is the most enjoyable, uh, but I really loved those early days of uh, Budget Cuts. That was, that was super cool. And now, uh, can you give us any hints about future projects you're working on? Future projects? Yeah. Uh, oh if God. it's okay. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, future projects. So I still have some unfinished projects. Uh, I, for some reason, I got pulled into obsessing over a thing called lerp smoothing uh, in, in games. Um, it's basically just a way to smooth motion. So if you have like, if you have like an object, let's see, white background, that's better. So like, if you have an object and you want to move it from point A to point B, right? Sometimes you want that to be smooth. So like mm -hmm. it starts out fast and then it slows down and then it, you maybe you want it to be dynamic. So it's like, it's kind of like an easing function where it just slows down as it gets close to its target. Um, there's a trick in game dev called lerp smoothing where it's just a simple lerp function that you shove into an update loop and then you kind of get that behavior um, and it's very easy to remember and implement and all of that. Um, but, um, the way that most people implement it is not frame rate independent. So if you if you you have like lag spikes in your game, or if you're running it on like a low end device, uh, the smoothing the approach speed is going to be different depending on which uh, platform you're doing it on. And and this this kind of like tossed me into like a, a huge amount of research into like differential equations because I hadn't learned those before. Um, and and so it just turned into this huge thing where I started like working on a talk, which I did, uh, that's on my YouTube channel. Um, the talk is called Lerp Smoothing is Broken, if you want to see it. Make um, sure to check it, guys. <laughs> uh, and then, um, right, and then I was going to also uh, write a blog post about Lerp Smoothing, because not everybody likes videos and talks and whatnot, so I was like, alright, I'm just going to write a blog post. And then the blog post exploded into a huge project as well. Um, I'm very bad at scoping, uh, and so, so it just grew out of control. Um, but it is, it is like, I think the, um, I think the blog post might be, how, how finished am I? I don't know, maybe like 80% done and 90% done. Um, so I'm just like, yeah, it's just like, I am sort of stuck uh, to some extent because I don't know how much I want to include in it, uh, but I'm almost done with it. Um, so I have a blog post about LERP smoothing coming up at some point. Um, and then I'm also working on a 3D modeling tool in Unity. Uh, and so 
that's a huge project as well, but um, I recently got past a like big hurdle in um, one of the one of the like silly asset management import export procedures in Unity. Um, there's a lot of quirks around that, and I recently got past that, and so so now I'm I'm back to working on that again. Um, I don't know when it's going to be done. Uh, it's a very like big undertaking to make like a 3D modeling tool, uh, but I I made a lot of progress on that, and so so we'll see whenever that's going to be finished. Congratulations. I will make sure I'll check it out and keep an eye on your channel and your vlogs as well. So another curiosity that I have is that if you have any particular people or content creators who inspire and motivate you on your professional journey. I don't think I have any like specific content creators. There's certain works from people that have inspired me. Like there's games that I've been inspired by. Like? Like uh, early on in my career or like even before my career, I guess, like the... Uh, Oddworld games, the Oddworld, Abe's Odyssey and Abe's Exodus. Uh, they were like PlayStation 1 games. They are platformers, but not really the arcade style platformers. They're more in the category called cinematic platformers. Yeah, those games were hugely inspirational for me in the beginning. Uh, and then I know that, um, what's his, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, but Alex Vlachos, Vlachos uh, at Valve um, released a really neat paper. It's like a tech art paper about like it was about encoding roughness values into the mid levels of your normal map, uh, which I think is a really cool idea. Uh, and and like it was also about like anisotropic specularity stuff and like filtering specular reflections specifically for VR. Uh, it was a really cool paper. I, I think that one sort of like unlocked a new way of thinking about stuff for me, which I really liked. Shader programming and tech art in general is one of those fields where the deeper you get into it, the more you can see all of the possibilities you can do. And you start like blending together concepts that you might not have thought of as the same. Like for example, if you want to remap a value range from like, I don't know, I have a value between zero and five and I want to remap it to like 120 and 200 or whatever. Uh, like that remap function that you might use in programming, that's actually the same function that you use in Photoshop when you do levels adjustment. Um, and it's very similar to a compressor if you're doing audio engineering. Uh, and so like you start seeing a lot of connections in, in the uh, how data relates to visuals, how that relates to uh, functions and operations in a way that I think no other field in game development really lets you do. Um, and, and yeah, so so like, I think that's why like a lot of the content that I've done is very like centered around technical art and to some extent mathematics, at least the last like five years. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are mentioning uh, three blue one brown in chat. That was definitely an inspiration for my math animations. So I saw a few comments on my channel uh, that people are very anxious when it comes to recording themselves while doing game development in general, like creating a game from scratch or stuff like that. Do you have any piece of advice for those who would love to start a YouTube channel but don't really feel like it at the moment? I think that would depend on why you want to start a YouTube channel uh, and why you want to stream. It takes a lot of work to have a, like, if you want to have a sustainable income doing Twitch or like YouTube streaming uh, or even just YouTube video creation, uh, that is very difficult. Like, I'm not even making a living with my YouTube videos. Like, I most of my income is, is from Patreon and the Unity Asset Store. Um, it is definitely not from YouTube. I cannot make a living on YouTube, even though I have videos with millions of views, right? Um, and so it takes a huge amount of investment to have any of these platforms be like financially sustainable. Uh, but if that's not your goal, then that might be fine. Like, if you if you just really enjoy making videos and you really enjoy making videos on YouTube or you really enjoy streaming or you enjoy the interaction with chat, like maybe it's worth it anyway, right? And so, so yeah, I guess it, I would say it just depends on your goal, but but if, if you're expecting it to be easy to kind of make it on Twitch or make it on YouTube, it is absolutely not. And you can definitely fall into this trap where like, you focus a little bit too much on the entertainment side of things where like, oh shit, I have to be entertaining at all times if I'm making a stream, right? Like I, if I'm streaming while working on my game, I have to work on the interesting things inside of the game. I can't just work on the boring parts, right? And then you fall into this trap of like, you're just, you're no longer working on the thing that you want to work on. You're working on the thing that your audience wants you to work on. Um, 
and that removes a lot of focus on the game itself. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think I would be careful with how you approach that kind of thing. Uh, but but it's also it's fun if you enjoy it, right? So so I think if you don't enjoy streaming and if you don't enjoy making videos on YouTube, I don't think you should do it uh, because there's not really much of a reason for it. Uh, but if you do enjoy it, then obviously there's more of a balance to be figured out there, I think. A very popular topic nowadays, AI, of course. How do you see the integration of artificial intelligence in game development and graphics? Hopefully not at all. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's the way that I see it. <laughs> uh, I am someone who is very much uh, against AI. Uh, I don't think it belongs in creative field, fields at all um, because uh, I guess I could go into all of the reasons. I have a lot of reasons why I don't think you should have uh, AI in creative fields. Um, so, so yeah, I'm personally not excited about it at all. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think it obviously it has a lot of use cases. There are like things you can use AI for. Yeah, in, in my view, unfortunately, it's definitely coming. Um, but but yeah, I'm not excited about it at all. It's okay, okay if you are. <laughs> I'm just not. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't say I'm excited about it, but it really helped me making my way out this year with university, especially in this field, because it helped me a lot. Like every error that I had or question that I wasn't able to find online, for example, ChatGPT was there <laughs> and he got my back. So yeah, unfortunately, I see your point. Yeah, I think so. there's a ChatGPT as a substitute for a like search engine, I think is the strongest like use case that I'm like more okay with. Um, like I've also used ChatGPT when like, I don't know, the other day I had like, my food was going sour after I'd stored it in the fridge for a while. And I was like, okay, so how long is it okay to store stuff in the fridge before it's okay that it's a little bit sour or if it's like bad or whatever. And just a simple search query for like um, leftovers, sour or whatever like a search for something like that and all i get is like google results on like how to make your food less sour or like some other like like search engine optimized like garbage websites right um and so so i think that the value with chat gpt is that it can understand your purpose of your like search query in a way that that like search engines can't because search engines are like mostly keyword based um but but like beyond that yeah, it could be a search and an enhancer, and I think it's useful for that purpose. Um, but I worry about the way that AI is going to make its way into creativity, because I legitimately value art if it's human-made, and if it's not human-made, I don't care about it at all. It can look exactly the same, it can be the same output, but if a human made it, I care about it, because now there's intent and purpose behind it. Um, but as soon as it's just generated by an AI, it's like it's created by nobody. And it, there's, it's like, it's just, it's just empty for me. It's just hollow, and there's no reason for me to be invested in a piece of art if nobody made it, right? Um, and so, so for me, like, ChatGPT as a search engine where you want to look something up real quick, where it can have some semantic understanding is like super useful. Like I, it's honestly useful. Uh, but within creativity, uh, I just think that AI will almost certainly only be used to replace humans effectively, uh, make more vapid games faster, like an obsession with like productivity over creativity. Uh, and I don't see like companies wielding this power in ethical ways or using it in creative ways. Um, there's definitely some like there's definitely some silver lining where it's possible to use it in creative ways, but that silver lining is so thin that all the negative stuff like overwhelms it entirely. Um, and that's like that's not even getting into all of the stuff around like misinformation and disinformation that AI is enabling already, right? Um, and so for me, like on balance, it's just not worth it. Like we don't need it. It is just a, it's just not necessary. And it's only making things like more hollow and vapid to me. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's how I feel about it. Um, yeah. so, so I don't know, I, I'm not excited about it. I see. Yeah, I'm also a bit scared about it because I said I was passionate about, and I still am passionate about psychology. It terrifies me a bit, but um, yeah, we will see. I hope the people will be able to manage 
all this power because it's a powerful tool that we don't really control. And the last question for today, do you have any advice for those who feel they are facing creative blocks or a lack of motivation? Uh, ooh. I guess it depends on what, what the reason is for the creative block. I haven't like looked into that too much. Certain things that have helped me uh, kind of get out of a creative block like that. Um, like if I'm working on a game or a tool and I'm not really, I don't really know what to do next. I don't feel like, I don't feel like super excited about it and I don't know where to go. And like, I don't know, feeling a little bit lost, kind of like that type of art block. Um, I think for, at least for games and for coding projects, uh, having someone try it out, I think kind of gives you a like rejuvenated perspective on it. Like if you have someone play your game or use your tool, um, you can sometimes like see them get excited about the thing that you're not excited about anymore. And then you're like, oh yeah, this is a pretty cool thing that I'm working on. And I actually do want to fix this one thing that they struggled with when they started using it. And like, I think just having like a, a perspective, like an outside perspective from someone else, uh, just to get out of your own head, I think that can be really useful. Um, although I don't know, like I wouldn't use that strategy for like if you're doing illustration, like the that kind of art block, that's not as good of a strategy, I think, because um, I think drawing is a lot more difficult to have something tangible along the way. It generally looks kind of ugly all the way up until you have at least a finished sketch, right? Um, so, so I don't know, like that part is much harder. Uh, but for game projects and tools and that kind of stuff, like just showing it to someone else is really useful. Um, but then like outside of that, there's general advice that's just useful for burnout in general um, because it could be that you're not just art blocked you could be on your way to burning out as well um, and so uh, when it comes to that stuff uh, number one important thing is you have to sleep you have to sleep like seven hours at least you, you have to like there's like there's no no way around it like no other thing that you're gonna like that you're gonna try to fix any sleep issues you have, it's not gonna work. Like you have to fix sleep first. Um, so if you haven't fixed your sleep, if you're like running on four hours of sleep every night, uh, that is bad for you. It is legitimately harmful. Uh, and as someone who's been burnt out, um, I wish someone like bonked this into my head that it's actually important to sleep. Uh, like if you're feeling well rested the day after, that doesn't mean you got good sleep. It's just down to the hours. You need to make sure you get the hours in. Um, so, and this this is not just coming from me. I went to rehab for burnout. That's what they said as well. That's what's like been researched when it comes to burnout. So number one is fix your sleep. Uh, it sounds silly, but that is just the number one thing. Um, and then another advice I would give is um, to get a change of environment and a change of perspective. Um, I think a lot of the times when we get stuck in a project and we don't get anywhere is because we're stuck in our own heads. Uh, like, you know, maybe you get up, you work on something at your computer, maybe you work from home so you never leave your house and you're just sitting there and then when you're done with your like, um, like if you're studying or whatever or if you're like doing work and then in the afternoon you're like, alright, I'm gonna work on my project and then you're still kind of stuck in the same space you've been in all day. Um, and for me, and for a lot of people, just like going for a walk uh, makes a huge amount of difference if it's just like, uh, if you if you feel stuck in certain thought loops. Um, uh, it doesn't fix everything, but I just noticed that it, it helps a lot when it comes to depression uh, for me. So I would try that if you for depression, it's really useful. Uh, it does not help for stress, I've noticed, but for depression, it helps a lot. Um, and then the... Uh, the number two thing on the, the most important things to fix your burnout and all of that stuff is uh, physical activity, uh, which is not exercise. Uh, it's a lot of people conflate these two, but physical activity is just very light movement. Uh, like mm -hmm. exercise, you usually have to push yourself to some extent, but for physical activity, like literally just going for a walk every day, like it could be five minutes. It doesn't have to be long at all. It could be two minutes. It could be one minute. Like anything is better than nothing. Um, and wherever that bar is, if you try to get like a little bit of it rather than nothing, that's going to make a huge difference uh, when it comes to burnout. Uh, so those two are the most most important things, I would say. Um, but it could also be that, that maybe it's not really burnout. Maybe you're just bored of a project and you want to like get excited again. So in that case, I think um, my strategy is usually to have multiple projects at once. 
uh, when I'm bored of a project, I just go to one of my other projects. And so, so I usually have like three or four projects running in parallel. Um, and if you're making a game, then you can like, well, maybe not everybody, but, but in, in, if you're an indie developer where you're kind of like wearing many hats at once, uh, then for me, when I'm like bored or, or stuck and like don't know how to get like past this like programming problem, uh, then just switching to a different field, like, okay, I'm just going to do 3D modeling today. I'm not going to do any programming for this project anymore because I'm, I'm stuck with this annoying problem. So just do some 3D modeling or some like design work or whatever. Um, so just kind of switching, switching your digital environment and not just your like IRL environment is also useful. Yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah, thank you very much for your time and your sincere inspirational answers. It's literally fascinating to hear about your journey and how you manage to positively impact the lives of those who follow you. Thank you once again. Take care and have fun while doing this live stream. Yeah, no, and, and thanks for thanks for having me on and reaching out. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. 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 So this was the interview. I am so excited and you don't have any idea how nervous I was while I did that. It was literally the first time ever in my entire life when I did something like this with someone with that many subscribers and stuff like i'm literally shaking she is the inspiration herself that's true exactly and i'm literally honored that i had this opportunity to talk to her like it's truly amazing she knows a lot she does she asks herself how many years of experience she has in this field she has a lot she built shader forge which is the thing for shaders in unity and she built it in 2015, so nine years, almost 10 years ago. Her soul is so young and she has a lot of life. You saw how much energy she had, literally, in everything she did. I was completely amazed.